Welcome to the Pencil Bob channel I hope you enjoy the story. Remember to like and subscribe and now the story. It's been a few years, so I may have some details in the wrong order, but they're essentially correct. I purchased my townhouse in the late 2000s. The previous owners were motivated to sell, for a good price. It was exactly what I wanted. Two bedrooms, multiple bathrooms, and a garage. From the mandatory home inspection, I was told about several potential problems with the unit. Some were internal, and others dealt with an outside balcony, leaky windows and cracked exterior paint. Before finalizing the sale, I was given the opportunity to ask about these issues, and was told that I was responsible for everything inside the townhouse, and the outside problems were handled by the condo association, and I just had to submit requests for repair. The condo association fee was very cheap for this area, so I considered that a plus. I closed on the sale, and I moved in without any problems. The total number of units in the complex is about 130, so it's a decent size. Some have two bedrooms, some three, and only a few, like mine, have garages with exterior balconies on them. When I moved in, I was presented with a list of the associations by laws for the property. Nothing major, most were what you'd expect, like keeping your entryway clean, dogs on leashes, guest parking, and such. There was a one pet limit that I could see everyone was ignoring, so I saw they were a bit lenient with the rules. I became friends with a neighbor, and she told me that the association was slow to handle problems. In fact, most of the units, conjoined in groups of six or more, were in dire need of new paint. Almost every unit had problems with their windows, but, the association was only replacing windows on the backs of the units, and only a handful at a time. The association's communication was pretty poor. We'd get infrequent newsletters, but they had an underlying tone of, we'll get to your issues when we can, no sooner than we feel like. They would also announce condo association board elections, but there seemed to be little interest, so they would appoint other owners to the board, as needed. About two years in, I got a printed newsletter from an owner in the complex, who we'll call Mike, claiming the board is ignoring the owners. It detailed a few things that weren't being addressed, like the paint and windows, and owner protests were being ignored. The board wasn't even holding annual open user meetings, which are specified in the association by laws. Those meetings were also for holding elections of new board members. The letter demanded a change in the situation. Enter Karen. Not her actual name, but it rhymes with Karen. She was the association's treasurer on the board. She was controlling the board and her word was apparently, law. That newsletter specifically called for her to step down. Next thing we know, there's an official association newsletter mailed to us, that calls the owner's newsletter a complete fabrication, and claimed Mike had ulterior motives. There was nothing to address the problems Mike mentioned, it was just generalized attack on him. Mike was initially asking for access to the association's books, and the association refused to show them to him. This is guaranteed in the association by laws. We received another newsletter detailing this and how he was going to take them to court if he was continually blocked. Another response from the association was mailed, but it was just attacking Mike and questioning his motives. I was visited by another neighbor, who was circulating a petition demanding change, and I gladly signed it. Nothing was being done, aside from standard groundskeeping and the occasional emergency repair. We received a few more newsletters from Mike, and several rebuttals from the association. Mike successfully sued to have access to the books. From the newsletters, he reported that what he saw was just a list of code numbers, not names, and dollar amounts for payouts. There was no way to really know who was receiving the money, or why. Somewhere in all these newsletters it was revealed that Karen, who was an accountant, was being paid by the association for her time, she's an accountant. Mike's newsletters also revealed that Karen chose the maintenance company, which was managed by, Marin, Karen's sister. Wow, what a surprise, not. The situation was getting worse. Tensions were high. Somewhere in here, the association mailed out a newsletter that claimed all the rebuttals they were mailing out were costing them a lot of money, more like $50, if you considered the postage, and it had to stop. Also, they announced that they were accepting candidates for the new election, and the form had to be mailed back in by a certain date. It was a step in the right direction but I soon realized that we received the newsletter on a Saturday, and the deadline for submitting was the following Tuesday. 
Karen could easily claim that no one had sent in their forms by the deadline. Other owners told me she'd been doing this trick for years, so she could appoint anyone she wanted to the board. The association was using a P.O. box, and the only way to get an application in on time was to go to the post office where the box was on Monday, and send a certified letter, to prove that it was received in time. Fat chance. Mike and his friends had hand-delivered those newsletters. One time, I saw someone walking around the complex, delivering the newsletter. I went down to retrieve it from my mailbox, right away, but I also noticed that Karen was going to every mailbox, pulling these newsletters out and was throwing them into the garbage as she went. I heard her say something like, it wasn't legally mailed. After that event, Mike sued to force a proper election, and the judge ordered it. For the election, we had to have a two-thirds owner majority present, either by attendance, or by signed proxy. On the day of election, many of us arrived at the meeting, and we noticed a security guard was standing by Karen, who was checking everyone in and giving them a ballot. She was expecting trouble. I heard her tell people they couldn't vote, because they were in arrears with their monthly dues, had outstanding fines, or were told they weren't the official owner of record. She disqualified many people. There were some arguments, but the security guard kept things civil. Note that our bylaws don't say anything about who can and can't vote, aside from the owner on record. On top of that, only a couple of candidates made it onto the ballot, excluding Mike and several others, who had definitely applied. The meeting started with Karen giving some general information, and the members were talking amongst themselves a lot. Many were pissed off about being refused a ballot, and others were complaining about all the candidates missing from the ballot. One of the last bits of information was that Karen announced that they would refuse any future letters sent by certified mail, because it required someone to go to the post office and acknowledge delivery on a certain date. She would normally get the mail whenever she felt like it. Karen was trying to circumvent the law by conveniently ignoring timely letters, like candidate applications and our monthly dues. Some owners brought up the possibility of re-entering Mike and the other candidates onto the ballot as write-ins, and the crowd voted with him, but the board refused to recognize the vote. Lastly, the votes were collected and counted, but the board president announced that they didn't have a two-thirds majority, so the election would be cancelled. We were only short a few people. The number of people Karen didn't give ballots to would have tipped the balance, surprise. The board quickly adjourned the meeting and left before people realized what was happening. That was a fun night. No one was happy. Mike was paying out of his own pocket for his lawyer, and it was getting expensive. I heard the number $20,000 mentioned. People did help defray the cost by donating to the cause, though. Mike was not done. He went back to court another time, to sue for a legal election. There was nothing in the bylaws that denied voting rights for past due balances, and Karen lied about at least one owner not being the owner of record. Armed with that information, the judge ordered another election, to be supervised by an independent, third-party lawyer. As I recall, the association's lawyer quit, because they kept going against his advice. They replaced him with a yes man. The third-party lawyer was in complete charge of the election, including collecting candidate applications. A reasonable deadline for applications was set, two weeks, and proxy ballots were sent out, as well. Karen's position was up for election, as were two other positions. We found out that the board president was appointed by Karen, but he was not an owner, and had to step down. Only owners can serve on the board. Finally, the election came, pretty much everyone showed up, or had provided proxy votes. There was definitely a two-thirds majority present, not including proxy votes. The lawyer called for three volunteers from the owners to count the ballots. The results were that four new people joined the board that night. They had gotten around 80 to 90 votes each. Another active board member got 17 votes, and Karen got 15, or something like that. We presume her votes were all proxy votes. I was wondering if they were going to go after Karen for getting paid and cooking the books, but the new treasurer received everything with proper records, names, this time, and not numbers. The maintenance company was tossed out, almost immediately. Karen sold her unit and moved to Florida, but not before arranging for some exterior beautification around her unit, complete with plant boxes, flowers and shrubs. We think she saw the writing on the wall and moved out before any backlash could occur. The association's lawyer was also replaced. Then came the bad news. 
The association had to pay out almost $50,000 in legal fees to fight against Mike and his lawsuits. Since the association was paying for the lawyer, we couldn't put the bill on Karen. What a pity. We later discovered that the long-term project fund, used for major upkeep of the complex, was pretty badly depleted, and needed to be refilled. Our lawyer advised us that for the size of the complex, it needed to be over $2 million, but there was less than $1 million in the fund. Fortunately, they didn't demand assessments, but instead, raised the monthly dues to start making up the difference. In the 15 years, I've been here, the dues went from $150 to $375, and go up annually now. Karen had ignored many of the longer-term projects, and in the next two to three years, the buildings were repainted, the roofs were re-shingled, bad windows were replaced, and all the balconies were completely rebuilt. In more recent years, our insurance company demanded we repave the roadway, because it was falling apart in places. They wouldn't insure it unless that was done immediately. These days, we have a better and more responsive maintenance company, and a Facebook page for general announcements and chit-chat. There are no real winners in this case, but after all of the required improvements were done, most of us feel better living here than during the dark time of Karen's reign. I would like to thank you for watching the video to the end. To encourage us to make more videos. Please. Like. Subscribe. Comment. As well as share. Check out this other video if you haven't already.